we've done so much in literally about two years of a Senate climate caucus. Uh, we've had untold numbers of industry leaders. And what I'd like to stress mostly, uh, I've been involved in this because I've been a conservationist my entire life. I've trailblazed on uh, conservation from the time I kind of knew what the word was. And when Chris asked me to join the Climate Caucus, it was an easy yes. We've come so far, and I want to focus on my side of the aisle. You, Chris has not had to do much convincing on his side, and I think that's where the tricky balance on what can work in a bipartisan way. I'm bringing some of my members out of the denial kind of phase to where they were not interested in having the word climate in the conversation. Natural solutions um, like the Trillion Trees Bill or the Growing Climate Solutions Bill, um, advanced nuclear, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, and energy efficiency are all areas where uh, I think we've seen legislative action at the end of last year. Uh, there was an Energy Policy Act of 2020 that was signed into law. Uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, there's investment in a number of these areas. Senator Cassidy and I co-sponsored the SCALE Act, uh, which would expand financing for carbon dioxide pipelines. Um, and I think there's real promise. Um, there's funding as well as authorization um, for expanding both basic and applied research demonstration and then utility scale work uh, across those four different areas uh, in bills that I think we're going to see at the president's desk soon. And, and when I take a look back throughout history, um, America has faced changes in their economy, uh, changes in industry um, throughout, throughout the entire time of throughout history. And, and every time that happens, uh, America steps up, we do big, bold things, um, and, and we tackle the future of our country head on. And, and that's what I think James was talking about right there. Um, right now, the word I would say, how, how does uh, the emerging energy market look for, for, for unions is opportunities. Um, I don't think it's, I think it's perfect yet, but it's an opportunity. There's opportunities that as we move forward, um, that we prioritize workers, we prioritize the communities that have been the most affected by uh, whether it's uh, climate uh, climate change, whether it's uh, socioeconomic issues, underserved communities. Um, if we can together tackle that and say this is the next big part of American history as, as, a, as a group, and we're going to put veteran workers, those 200,000 workers, uh, to work building our future just like we did after World War II when it came to infrastructure. In many ways, decarbonizing the electricity system is the easiest in this complex puzzle of decarbonizing the economy. Uh, but that is not at all to say that it is easy. There are a number of public policy and market barriers, as well as just business barriers that, that prevent us from decarbonizing the electricity system. So it's the easiest, but it's not easy. Uh, in order to ensure that some of the harder to abate sectors, such as thermal, aviation, agriculture, deforestation, some of those more challenging areas have enough time and runway to decarbonize by 2050, we really need to accelerate the decarbonization of the power grid. The extractive resource development model is not sustainable. And what the Navajo Nation has done that we just saw in this video is flip that extractive resource model on its head. And that, and, and I, I have to say it up front, that extractive model of, of how you develop, you go to a place, you extract its resource uh, from the ground and usually not including the people who are most deeply impacted by your activity uh, and you export it off somewhere. That was Alaska's model for decades. 